Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Randy Hughes. I am the manager, Energy and Water at Geoscience BC. Uh, welcome to the next generation of clean energy and CCS research in BC webinar. Uh, today, we're going to hear from Dr. Steve Grasby uh, and from two of our Geoscience BC energy scholarship winners, uh, Fatima Omozadeh and Maziar Nazami. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Calgary in the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Back Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Pigani, and the Kainai First Nations, and the Susina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. I also acknowledge that Geoscience BC's public geoscience takes place in the territories of many First Nations throughout British Columbia. I'll remind the speakers uh, to stay on mute and off screen until they are speaking or presenting. Uh, so we've partnered today with our friends at the Canadian Society for Evolving Energy, also known as CSEE, for this webinar. And we'll feature a Q&A session after the presentations moderated by CSEE representative and Geoscience BC volunteer, Dr. Brad Hayes. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of Geoscience BC, uh, then introduce our moderator, Brad. Thank you. Oh, about Geoscience BC. So uh, Geoscience BC, we're a, a not-for-profit society. Uh, public geoscience um, is a first link in the supply chain for Canada's net zero emissions economy. Our research improves our collective level of geoscience knowledge, informs responsible natural resource development and investment decisions, catalyzes socioeconomic opportunities, stimulates innovation and geoscience technologies, and all of our research uh, is made uh, public and is available on our website. So for our uh, geoscience BC structure, uh, our research is funded by industry, government, trusts, and others. Uh, since we launched our membership uh, campaign in January of 2022, we have over 180 uh, corporate, individual, student, and associated members. Uh, and we have a strong governance uh, by volunteers, including our board of directors and Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation Advisory Council, and by three technical advisory committees. So we have three focus areas that support net zero emissions transition. Uh, the first is identifying critical minerals and metals. Uh, including regional geophysics and geochemistry. Uh, we do innovative earth science and data, <clears throat> excuse me, to attract new investment. Uh, and we de-risk exploration and discoveries. Our second focus area, advancing carbon capture and storage. Uh, we understand there's a wide need for uh, CCS geological information for all uh, entities to make informed decisions. So we identify and assess carbon storage targets in BC, including carbon mineralization, and within sedimentary basins, such as uh, deep saline aquifers as carbon sinks. And finally, our third focus area, catalyzing clean energy. Uh, we undertake regional projects advancing geothermal, power generation, electrification of industrial sites, and low carbon hydrogen generation. So I encourage you to think about how uh, public geoscience can advance the things that you are working on uh, and how you can contribute. Uh, you can join Geoscience BC as a member and be part of the conversation about the research that is needed. You can contribute to research through funding or in-kind contribution to make that research happen. Uh, and you can advocate for Geoscience BC in your network, encouraging others to do the same. With that, I'd like to introduce you to Brad Hayes, who will facilitate today's webinar. Uh, Brad is president of Patrell Robertson Consulting Limited, a geoscience and engineering consulting firm advising clients working on oil and gas, helium and lithium exploration, carbon capture and storage, geothermal energy and water resource management. Brad holds a PhD in geology from the University of Alberta and has 40 years of diverse experience applying subsurface geoscience in resource industries. He's an adjunct professor in the University of Alberta Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, outreach director for the Canadian Society for Evolving Energy, a past president of the Canadian Society of Petroleum Geologists and a member of the Energy Resources Technical Advisory Committee for Geoscience BC. So with that, I'll hand it over to Brad. Thanks, Randy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to uh, three great presentations. 
I want to dive right into it because our speakers have a lot to say and we've only got uh, an hour. So I'm going to introduce each of them in turn. Uh, they will give their presentations and then we should be done up with uh, 10 or 15 minutes left at the end for questions. Uh, I believe that uh, you can uh, post questions to the Q&A box uh, if you've got something to ask one of the uh, speakers specifically. So first up, uh, Dr. Steve Grasby from the Geological Survey of Canada. Uh, Dr. Grasby received a PhD in geochemistry from the University of Calgary in 1997. He has worked on regional groundwater studies in the Canadian prairies and in British Columbia, including climate change impacts of regional water supply. He's also conducted extensive studies on thermal and mineral springs in Western and Northern Canada. He has led revival of geothermal research in Canada and has served as president of Geothermal Canada. In addition, he has worked extensively on paleoclimate crises as a driver of mass extinctions through the Phanerozoic with a particular focus on sedimentary records in the Canadian Arctic Islands. Today, Dr. Grasby will be giving us a presentation entitled Garibaldi Geothermal Volcanic Belt Assessment Project. Steve, floor is yours. Great, uh, thanks Brad, and I'll just share my screen here. And just if you can Confirm you can hear me and the all, all good, works. Steve. Yep. You see the full the full yep. screen. Great. Well, thanks everyone. And really it's a Here pleasure today to just give an introduction to the work that uh, Fatima has done as part of a larger project to look at the geothermal potential of the Garibaldi volcanic belt. It was a project led by the, the Geologic Survey of Canada under my um, tutelage, but with a large team of people that made this all possible. The driver is just supporting Canada's transition to a low carbon economy. This is a huge task that we face to get to net zero emissions by 2050. If you look currently, Canada is still about 89% non-renewable energy resources. And we need to greatly expand the small wedge of 11% of renewables to uh, compensate for the, the carbon emitting sources. It's a big challenge. You can see already that of the renewables we use, hydro is a big wedge. It's unlikely that's going to get much bigger. So it's going to be that other part, which is going to be a mixture of solar, wind, and geothermal power. Geothermal is really a highly uh, attractive form of renewable energy because it's the only renewable that's dispatchable and can provide a base load renewable power energy supply. But so far to Canada, it's been very uh, limited in its um, development. So we wanted to change that, and this has been part of the driver of this program. I want to recognize the team of people involved, as I said. Uh, there is over 34 people that participated in this project, so it's certainly not just me. Um, a number of different universities are involved, and particularly a number of different graduate students, including Fatima, who uh, we recognize today. And particularly, I want to thank uh, Squamish and Lowat First Nations, whose traditional lands we conducted the research on with their um, awareness and support. And funding for this project that came from Geoscience BC and then NRCAN's Energy um, Emerging Renewable Power Program, plus the salary dollars committed from the GSC, as well as the different university participants. And recognizing the endless support of Richmond, uh, Richard Truman and Randy Hughes from Geoscience BC that's uh, really helped to make this project happen. Uh, Meager Creek Development Corporation, which is the company that now owns a geothermal lease at Mount Meager, uh, interjects renewable energy who supported our work and uh, particular recognition to the uh, amazing pilots at No Limits Helicopters who have uh, got us all over the area safely and securely and, and are just a fantastic group to work with. So what is the Garibaldi Volcanic Belt? It's a chain of volcanoes that extends uh, in southern British Columbia, so, sort of from Squamish up uh, north of Mount Meager. So this is this chain of green dots you see in the map on the right, and the red dots represent thermal springs that occur in the same region. But it's just really the northern extent of the Cascade uh, Belt of volcanoes that are formed due to subduction of the Pacific uh, slab underneath North America. So you have uh, dehydration melting going on. You have lots of, uh, of uh, magma rising up through the crust. 
and expressing itself as a chain of volcanoes. So this includes Mount St. Helens that we probably all know of and Mount Baker just south of Vancouver, but it also extends up into the, the Mount Garibaldi, Mount Meager, Mount Cayley area north of Vancouver. And these are the areas that we focused on for this geothermal work. Uh, this area has been the focus of geothermal activity for quite a while in Canada. It's not a surprise to look at volcanoes if you want to look at something hot that can produce uh, heat and power. Um, back in the 70s, there was a geothermal energy program run by the federal government, and, and um, this included collaborative work between NRCAN and BC Hydro that conducted test drilling at Mount Meager. So the photo here is showing the, the Meager Creek number one well, the first well drilled, um, and the steam billowing out from this um, the site and and they actually put a small generator on this location it was the first geothermal power ever produced in Canada it was just a small test generator 250 kilowatts and it was never connected to a uh, line so the power was never used subsequent to that uh, cancellation of that research program in 1985 uh, the site was taken over by industry and a number of series of different wells have been drilled in the region and this uh, map and the the bottom shows Meager Creek. You can see at the very bottom of the map and the black lines show the, the well pass projecting down into the southern flank of Mount Meager. And the red lines represent the temperatures that they've intersected. So you can see there's over 240 degrees Celsius uh, temperatures that these wells have identified. There's uh, even more detailed depth temperature measurements. These are shown by these series of lines. And each color line is just a different well that's been drilled. A, a different temperature record. Uh, very high thermal gradients in the shallow surface, which is typical of a convective upwelling zone. And um, they, you know, they get up to 260 degrees Celsius at you know, a, a kilometer's depth, right? So th this is really just a, a world-class geothermal system when you have such high temperatures at very shallow depths. Now, uh, I guess you ask them, why has this not been developed to date? But one of the challenges that this drilling has had is that they found the high temperatures, but not the zones that you need to produce enough water to produce that thermal energy to surface where you can make use of it. So just getting temperature is not good enough. You also need to find a permeable porous aquifers at those depths that you can produce sufficient volumes of water to make this economically viable energy resource. And this has been um, the, the focus of this project then, is how can we de-risk the expense of drilling of wells to better identify where in the subsurface the, the geothermal reservoirs are? Um, this was really spurred and aided by initial work by Geoscience BC, and it's very remarkable what they've done is convince all the uh, industry players that have worked in the area to share publicly all the data that's ever been collected. So we have the research data collected by Government of Canada, BC Hydro, and then later all the industry data has all been compiled and all been made publicly available through uh, efforts of Geoscience BC. And this has been summarized in this great report by, by Witter in 2019. We use that to inform a plan of how we want to um, better uh, study this area and, and developed a, a four-year project that occurred over two phases of the first phase focusing on Mount Meager, because this is where we had all the data that we know of. And then a second phase looking at Mount Cayley to the south um, where we can import some of the lessons from the, the early work and see what we can learn in a, in a less data rich environment. As mentioned already, this has included researchers from the Geological Survey of Canada, plus seven universities, uh, several in BC, uh, U of A, U of C, and also uh, uh, Swiss University. It's four summers field work, uh, most of that through the COVID time. So there's a lot of challenges of being socially isolated within a small helicopter that uh, was uh, probably some of the most challenging logistical field work I've ever had to organize but we still uh, were successful in getting out every summer uh, in, in, uh, in uh, following all the different regulations that were evolving quickly over time. And I think a really exciting part of this project was just training the next generation of researchers in Canada, including postdocs, PhDs, masters, and, and BSc students. And this is including Fatima, who we'll hear from next, 
And, and it's really part of what Canada needs to make geothermal a success in the future is the bright minds and the new generation of, of researchers that can help us um, de-risk this the exploration and development and utilization of this thermal energy resource. The project was really looking at a whole broad spectrum of different techniques to uh, study geothermal systems. So this is including gravity surveys, uh, magnetotellurics, which is a, a method of looking at passive uh, electromagnetic fields moving through the Earth's systems and how can it help us interpret uh, structures in, the, in depth. And this is what Fatima's contribution was. We had passive seismic, new age dating, uh, bedrock mapping and, and fracture measurements remote sensing, thermal uh, measurements, and resource modeling to try to predict how much resources we can extract from the area. These results have been uh, made all publicly available as per tradition of Geoscience BC, as uh, Randy just said, in a series of reports. And the last one uh, is just gonna be released uh, in, in May, I'm told, in the next couple of weeks. So all of the data that we've collected is is accessible online through Geoscience uh, BC portal portals, and there's a, a lot of other more technical outputs as well from this, including a series of, of published papers, including some uh, uh, you can see at the top right here with the uh, first author is Fatima, who we're speaking about today. Um, but there's been four new geological maps, eleven peer-reviewed science papers. There's at least five more in progress right now. Uh, there's been two masters and two, three PhDs that have been completed, uh, numerous conference presentations, and then just new methods developed for MT inversion, ground temperature analysis. But again, I think the most importantly, the new collaborations and the new geothermal researchers that have been produced as part of this work. Um, finally, we're just getting into the resource modeling part of this uh, and developing some AI methods to inter interrogate the data that's been collected and to integrate it to develop a subsurface 3D uh, image of what lies under these volcanoes and where we can best target the geothermal resources and using this to predict uh, the type of energy production that we see can be sustainably produced for uh, over 30 years. And, um, you know, these are just some preliminary numbers, but, uh, you know, we're saying for two well pairs, we could look at 28 megawatts potentially uh, for, you know, for two wells over 30 years. And this has to then go into economic models to verify the value of these resources and in, in the future productivity. And with that, I'll just uh, end with a nice shot of the team setting up a, a seismic monitoring station on Mount Meager on a beautiful day in the mountains and uh, look forward to any questions and and uh, I'll just pass it off back to you, Brad. Great, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, that was a, a great setup for uh, our next talk, which is going to be by Fatima Hormazada, as, as uh, Steve mentioned. And I'll just uh, give you a, a little bit of background on Fatima before she starts. She recently received her PhD in her sciences from Carleton University, one of the collaborators in the project that Steve described. Uh, during her PhD, she was involved in various collaborative projects and field work at the GSC, under the supervision of geophysicists, Mr. Jim Craven, Dr. Dariush uh, Motazedian, and Dr. Steve Grasby. These projects resulted in many published and in-prep scientific contributions. She was a Geoscience BC scholarship recipient in 2022 and 2023. In addition to Geoscience BC scholarships, her research endeavors have been acknowledged through numerous prestigious national and international awards and scholarships, including the Research Affiliate Program from GSC, the Best Student Research Project from Geothermal Canada, the Outstanding Student Pursuing Innovative Research from KEGS, and the Outstanding Graduate Student Award and Senate Medal from Carleton University. Fatima's presentation today is entitled Three-Dimensional Modeling of Geothermal Systems in the Garibaldi Volcanic Belt, Canada, using magnetotelluric magneto data. Fatima, please take it away. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, can you see the slides? Yep, all good to go. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Um, 
and welcome to my talk. I'm going to be talking about uh, modeling of Mount Meagher using magnetotelluric data um, geophysics, which was a part of uh, my PhD research. Global warming, which can be a result of burning fossil fuels and CO2 emission, is an urgent challenge and needs uh, our attention. In addition to increasing global temperature, by adding more CO2 to the atmosphere, people are causing severe environmental effects, such as frequent wildfires, um, intense storms, melting ice sheets, and public health uh, impacts. Renewable energy resources can help in addressing uh, these issues. And one of the renewable energy resources is geothermal energy. Heat from the Earth's uh, crust warms underground water, and when this water becomes hot enough, it can move through permeable rocks or fractures and transfer heat to the near surface, and we can access it um, hot water or energy. Conventional geothermal systems can be economically viable only when three factors should exist uh, in the Earth. There should be heat source, fluid, and permeable rocks. I had a goal in my PhD to study these elements in a geothermal field, but where would we find such geothermal potentials to study in Canada? As Dr. Uh, Dr. Steve Grasby mentioned, Mount Meagher is an active volcano in 150 kilometer north of Vancouver. It's situated between Illilouette River and Meagher Creek in the south. The north side of Meagher Creek has been studied over um, decades, and um, there are main structures in this region. There are uh, four faults, uh, Meager Creek Fault, No Good Fault, uh, Camp Fault, and Carbonate Fault. And there are also uh, thermal springs, uh, which suggest an active uh, geothermal system. The idea then is to see, um, can we access the resources underlying there? In my PhD, I evaluated uh, elements of economically viable uh, geothermal system and assess um, geothermal potentials in Mount uh, Meagher. First, I aim to define uh, reservoir patterns and see where fluid may exist. Then I had a goal to find petrophysical properties of fluid pathways such as porosity and permeability. And finally, I aim to model subsurface temperature uh, within the geothermal system. We need a methodology to study these uh, three elements. One exciting thing is uh, that we can use geophysics to address these. And one of the geophysical techniques is uh, magnetotelluric or MT. Uh, variations in Earth's uh, electromagnetic field from solar wind or uh, lightning storms penetrates down to the Earth and uh, we have electrodes and coils set up on the Earth's surface and measure something named apparent resistivity of the subsurface. Since EM waves span a broad range of uh, frequencies, they allow for a wide range of investigation depths. The AMT frequency uh, range maps uh, shallow structures. MT is sensitive to electrical resistivity contrast, which uh, is so helpful in exploration of geothermal reservoirs because there is a contrast between um, resistive host strike and electrically conductive targets such as clay minerals, fluids, or melts. Now we can go over Mount Meagher data. The MT data that I worked on are from three different data sets. The first set of the, uh, the data is from these seven stations along uh, Meagher Creek. The second data were collected um, in these 30 stations. And the third data set were uh, collected in 2019 in 84 AMT sounding uh, to study shallow structures in a dense grid. Now that we saw the location of the data, we can go through uh, to see the data and uh, the modeling or results. These plots are a sample of apparent resistivity and phase uh, based on the period after processing the uh, uh, empty data. I have uh, selected two of the stations uh, to show the data feed after running inversion uh, using RLM3D. The raw AMT data as shown here are uh, shown as squares and circles. And uh, we can compare it with uh, these lines that are results from the inversion. 
This shows how well um, the model result uh, fit the data. And I have two samples here. And I'll show um, you the uh, modeling of um, these three puzzle pieces as the key elements of geothermal system. The first element is subsurface structures. I used um, empty data to model subsurface structures to see if there is a possibility of geothermal reservoir patterns at Mount Meager. These plan views show the result of resistivity distribution at different elevations. The warmer, uh, warmer colors are um, conductive and the cooler colors are uh, resistive structures. Key conductives in the area are highlighted as C1 and C2, um, you can see in these plan views. And the resistive structures are R1 and R2. C1 extends um, east-west along north of uh, Meager Creek, and conductor C2 extends northward, uh, which still exists when we go uh, deeper and move to deeper um, views. It is bonded, this C2 is bonded by no good fault, um, which could provide possible uh, pathways for circulating uh, hydrothermal fluid. Based on these resistivity uh, structures and also geological logs, C1 and C2 were interpreted as hydrothermally altered uh, rocks, which are so helpful because they can concentrate the flow uh, into particular areas. You can find more information about subsurface structures in uh, this paper. And the second element that I studied at Mount Meager was evaluating petrophysical properties. I used um, empty resistivity model as the bulk resistivity and correlated that with laboratory measurements of fluid resistivity and also used different models such as modified Archie's law and Hessian Schrickman bonds to find um, the range for porosity. So the results show the porosity range of uh, 0.1 uh, to 8.5%, which correspond to permeability range uh, of less than 0 0.25 millidarsis. And again, you can find more information about petrophysical properties at Mount Meager in, in this paper. So now uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the rest, how I evaluated uh, temperature at Mount Meager. So there are studies in the literature that examined um, the variation of electrical resistivity with temperature on different rock types uh, based on uh, the laboratory measurements. They considered many constant factors in their uh, measurements, but uh, I used ANT resistivity model as the base model to find thermal properties at Mount Meager. I wanted to find a relationship between resistivity and temperature at these cells that uh, we had temperature measurement logs and apply that relationship uh, to the whole 3D resistivity model instead of using interpolation techniques to find uh, temperature at these locations. So in addition to AMT um, model that I had, I used borehole temperature logs from these locations. To study Mount Meager, first I started to use um, known models from literature to see if it's applicable uh, for temperature predictions at Mount Meager. For example, this is one of the models. Uh, it was um, correlated based on uh, geothermal reservoirs in Iceland, and I applied it to the AMT resistivity model to see if it can predict temperature at cells with known measured temperature lag. In deep boreholes, the model predicts temperature at uh, temperatures lower than uh, 220 uh, degrees Celsius, but using the model in shallower borehole um, completely failed. And one potential reason may be um, that this model was generated for a geothermal field in Iceland with its own rock type and characteristics. So I wanted to find the model for Mount Meager. I wanted to see if I can find a regression or classification technique to cluster temperature versus resistivity. So I started by finding regression for borehole data. And this kind of relationships that are known as therm thermoelectric um, coefficients are so helpful. If I could find a, a coefficient for each part of our survey, I could apply it to the bulk resistivity data from AMT model and estimate temperature. 
data showed a pattern in one of the boreholes, and next borehole also showed pattern, but they were different at each well. And the data didn't show a unique pattern. So I uh, plotted all the data to see if I can cluster them, but uh, the classification techniques were not able to find the model for the data. So when the data needed a, um, another method to capture the complex patterns, I used MLP neural network, the input layer received the input data and forwarded it uh, to the hidden layer with mathematical operations to extract features. And finally, the output layer produced the predictions. I used the location of the data, resistivity, and temperature as input for the algorithm. And like all machine learning approaches, first the model was adjusted based on the training data. Then um, during the development, I had uh, the validation data set. Um, for these two different um, data sets, we have over 1,000 um, known data points. And at the end, the data were tested using um, test data set and three boreholes will, were excluded uh, from the previous uh, steps to be tested here. So 70% uh, percent of the data were randomly selected for training the model. This figure shows the predicted temperature uh, versus the measured temperature logs. And uh, it showed an R square of uh, 0 0.90. Seven and during the development of the model, 30% of data randomly again used for validating the model. And um, since we cannot tell the accuracy of the model based on training set because it could memorize the data, and also we cannot use validation data set because um, we already picked the best model based on uh, the validation data set. So I used three uh, temperature lags that were not included in previous steps. And this um, scatter plot shows the correlation between the predicted and the measure uh, sets. And I applied the model to the test data. Uh, this is a measure temperature lag in a shallow borehole. And if I want to give uh, you a sense of how previous known models uh, are, for example, this blue line is the result of previous known models. and um, this red line shows the predicted temperature using uh, my modeling. And again, in the second borehole, we have a temperature lag. This blue line is the result of previous model. And this is how um, the MLP modeling uh, predicted temperature. And again, this is um, in another test uh, lag. This is the previous model. And uh, this is um, our modeling. So now that I uh, had uh, the model, I applied it to the whole survey, to the ANT model to estimate temperature from a geophysical uh, model. It can be helpful, especially in zones far from the boreholes. So I modeled key elements of a uh, viable geothermal system for Mount Meager uh, in my PhD. And as a result of combining um, AMT model with laboratory rock samples, fluid chemistry, well logs, um, I concluded that uh, the AMT model showed um, that the const uh, conductive structures um, are bonded by two main local faults that uh, uh, extend, one of them extend uh, downward uh, along the no good fault and above Meager Creek. And using um, known temperature data from uh, borehole lags and electrical resistivity data, uh, from the AMT model, temperature maps for Mount Meager uh, were produced uh, for up to uh, three kilometers. And the proposed ANN uh, model outperformed other per, um, previous uh, models. And uh, finally, I would like to thank and appreciate uh, my supervisors, Jim and Dariush, for their help and support. And also thank uh, to Dr. Steve Grasby for always supporting me and supervising the whole project. And thanks to NRCAN and Geoscience PC for funding and Meager Creek development for water chemistry and all people who had during the field work and during my PhD. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chef Fatima. That was uh, very interesting modeling work. Uh, and thank you for sharing it with us. Our yeah. final pr presentation uh, this morning is from Masiar Nazemi. He's a PhD student at Simon Fraser University. 
Uh, Maziar began his PhD program at SFU in the fall of 2021 under the supervision of Professor Shaheen Dashgar. Uh, prior to joining SFU, he obtained his MSc in Petroleum Geology from the University of Tehran, Iran, in 2019, and his BSc in Petroleum Engineering in 2013. Maziar graduated as the department's top-ranked student in his MSc. During his MSc program, Maziar conducted research on the influence of porosity type on stochastic petrophysical calculations, specifically focusing on Archie exponents. Maziar's current research project is about the 3D reconstruction of the Georgia Basin in BC's southwest region and its potential for carbon sequestration adjacent to BC's lower mainland. Maziar's research interests encompass petrophysics, carbon capture and underground storage, reservoir characterization, reservoir modeling, sedimentology, basin analysis, and basin modeling. Furthermore, he was awarded the SFU Graduate Dean's Entrance Scholarship in 2021, the Canadian Energy Geoscience Association, or SEGA, uh, Regional Graduate Student Scholarship, and the Geoscience BC Scholarship in 2022. Uh, Maziar's presentation today is entitled Geological and Engineering Considerations for CO2 Storage in Deep Saline Aquifers in Tectonically Active Regions, Implications for the Lower Mainland, BC, Canada. Matthew, please take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Brad. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Maziar, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Earth Sciences uh, at Simon Fraser University. Today, I will be presenting a part of my PhD research titled uh, Geological and Engineering Consideration uh, for CO2 Storage in Deep Saline Aquifers in Tectonically Active Regions, Implications for the Lower Mainland BC, Canada. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to quickly go over an outline of what this presentation will cover. First, uh, we'll go to, uh, over the introduction and study area of my research project. Afterward, we will go over some of the relevant information to the geological background, exploration history, and regional studies. Then we will cover the CO2 and storage mechanisms and fundamentals in deep sailing aquifers and finish with the favorable characteristics uh, for CO2 storage in deep saline aquifers with data from the lower mainland BC. As we all are probably aware, the amounts of CO2 have been increasing in the global atmosphere since the industrial revolution. Uh, higher CO2 concentration increases the natural greenhouse effect. Therefore, we need to find the practical solution to decrease carbon emission. Carbon capture and underground storage CCS is a viable solution over the short to uh, medium term. Deep sailing aquifers have emerged as a primary target reservoir for several large scale CCS projects and are recognized as uh, having the greatest long term potential for CCS globally. In this study, I review the critical factors that must be considered in identifying sites uh, for CC and CO2 storage in deep saline aquifers hosted in silicic classic sedimentary strata in tectonically active region. Lower mainland BC is located in the southeast of the Georgia Basin. The region is home to over 60% of British Columbia's population, approximately 3 million people. Major industrial hubs uh, with several large carbon emitters are located in the area. Uh, Lower mainland BC uh, ha has been previously uh, studied for hydrocarbon potential and natural gas storage. However, no significant uh, effort has been uh, made to evaluate the feasibility of CCS uh, in the area. The Georgia Basin is a northwest southeast oriented structural and topographic depression in the southern part of Canadian Cordillera. The strata underlying the lower mainland BC belong to the Georgia Basin, and the Silicic Classic field of Georgia Basin is up to six kilometer thick. The stratigraphy of the Georgia Basin below uh, LMBC or lower mainland BC comprise, uh, comprises the Upper Cretaceous Nanaimo group and Cenozoic strata of Huntington and Boundary Bay formation, which are considered as potential uh, reservoirs for CCS uh, in the LMBC. The first petroleum exploration well was drilled uh, on the Canadian side of Georgia Basin in 1906. Out of all drill wells in the Georgia Basin below uh, LMBC, 
11 bells have well life. Uh, various seismic surveys were conducted from 1955 to 1988 on the Lower Mainland. However, uh, only approximately 600 kilometers of 2D seismic reflection lines remain available in digital and paper format, as you can see on the figure, uh, all the location of the 2D seismic reflection lines. The feasibility of uh, storing CO2 in subsurface in saline aquifers is controlled in part by the properties of CO2 gas at temperature greater than 31.1 uh, Celsius and pressure greater than 7.38 MPa, which is a critical point. CO2 enters a supercritical state, which typically occurs at the subsurface depth of approximately 800 meters. The efficient storage of CO2 in supercritical or liquid state is uh, aided by its high density, which reduces buoyancy forces and allows for more uh, effective use of available pore space. Various mechanisms contribute to the storage of CO2 in saline aquifers, including structural, stratigraphic trapping, residual trapping, mineral trapping, and solubility trapping. The structural stratigraphic trapping involves the confinement of supercritical CO2 in the pores of water saturated sedimentary media below uh, low permeability rock, like cap rock. Uh, residual trapping refers to the storage of injected CO2 by capillary forces in the pores of reservoir rocks, and it is an important CO2 storage mechanism with a high degree of long term storage safety. Solubility trapping occurs when injected CO2 uh, dissolves in formation water, and eventually mineral trapping can occur uh, under favorable geological conditions when a portion of injected CO2 forms uh, carbonate minerals. Mineral trapping is a promising mechanism for long-term storage CO2. Mobile supercritical CO2 in saline aquifer is less dense than res uh, resident brine, and its buoyancy drives its migration under confined uh, cap rock. If cap rock, for whatever reason, is compromised, for example, contains high permeability, fractures, or penetrated by poorly cemented wellbores, it may fail to retain uh, buoyant CO2. And the injected CO2 will flow upward and escape through high permeability zones. So once CO2 is dissolved in formation brine, buoyancy forces become negligible, and the trapped CO2 remains uh, in the saline aquifer with a minimal risk of leakage. In situ and ex situ methods uh, can significantly accelerate CO2 dissolution in uh, deep saline aquifers. So ex situ dissolution involves uh, mixing compressed CO2, uh, and tar uh, compressed CO2 and target formation brine at the surface and injecting the CO2 brine mixture into the subsurface uh, saline aquifer. In in situ, the solution CO2 and uh, brine are injected simultaneously in a well bore. So a static mixture is used as a mass transfer device to mix them uh, at the bottom of the well. Uh, here I discuss uh, key characteristics of sedimentary basins and sedimentary strata required for CO2 storage in tectonically active region. Uh, I also summarize and present information on these characteristics from uh, Lower Mainland BC. In the Georgia Basin below uh, LMBC and Northwest Washington State, borehole temperatures are derived uh, from 18 wells using bottom hole temperature recorded on wireline log headers and uh, drill seam test DSD reports. The area defined uh, by crosshatch pattern in figure A is for Georgia Basin and blue, green, and orange lines are calculated based on the five lowest average and five highest uh, calculated geothermal gradients in the lower mainland BC and Northwest uh, Washington. Uh, figure B uh, represents variation in CO2 density as a function of uh, temperature and pressure. So the data uh, along the geothermal gradient lines show CO2 density uh, at 500 meters, uh, 1000 meter, 1500 meter, as, and 2000 meter deep uh, in the lower mainland BC. Uh, considering the temperature measurements uh, acquired from Lower Mainland BC and Northwest Washington State, a plausible estimation of region-wide geothermal gradient for that area is 20.1 uh, Celsius per kilometer. Of course, I must say that that's uh, been calculated without uh, any correction applied due to insufficient data. Uh, so uh, the average is uh, simply an average of all measurements. Uh, the figure on the left side represents geothermal gradient based on recorded borehole temperatures and the right side temperature recorded uh, via DSD. 
Lower mainland BC overlies uh, more than 4,500 meters sedimentary strata in the southern extent of um, western LMBC, and these strata tend to north and east. Uh, tertiary strata reach maximum thickness of 2,800 meters, mainly, uh, as you can see on the map, uh, on the cross section, sorry, uh, in the western and uh, lower mainland BC. Uh, moving eastward, upper Cretaceous strata shallow up and uh, get thinner. Preserved tertiary strata in the lower mainland BC have a net porous sandstone thickness of at least uh, 447 to 1,256 meter, and average porosity draw from well logs uh, range ranges from 12 to 23 percent. In upper Cretaceous strata, well log coverage is incomplete, of course, but where data is available, the average porosity ranges from 12.5 to 20 percent. Water samples were collected from seven wells to uh, figure out about the salinity range of uh, pore water salinity. And uh, so the range for uh, tertiary is 751 to 37,043 ppm. And for upper Cretaceous, uh, the salinity is uh, 10,248. Uh, in the LMBC, tertiary strata com uh, comprise mainly uh, quartz, detrital mica, chert, uh, lithic fragment, plagiar clay, feldspar, and organic matter. Upper Cretaceous rocks contain mainly quartz, feldspar, rock fragments, minor mica, gluconite, trace, uh, heavy metals, and organic matter. Uh, results obtained from DST or drill seam test uh, indicate that in some wells and intervals, tertiary strata have suitable permeability and potential reservoir size to enable CO2 storage. Uh, limited DST is available for upper Cretaceous strata. Uh, in terms of seismicity, southwestern uh, Western British Columbia and northwest. Uh, Western United States are a region with a high seismic hazards due to their proximity to an active subduction zone. So the LMBC has experienced relatively a few shallow earthquakes, like shallower than six uh, kilometers deep over the past 46 uh, years compared to further south and east, as you can see on the map. Uh, two dimensional seismic reflection surveys acquired in 1977 across uh, the LMBC were used to map upper Cretaceous and tertiary surfaces and trace uh, faults in subsurface. So faults uh, that cross cut tertiary and upper Cretaceous strata are dominantly normal or truss fault, as you can see. So the top uh, figure. Uh, shows the top of tertiary time structure map and the uh, lower one is top of upper Cretaceous time structure map for uh, upper Cretaceous, which obviously shows a lot of uh, fault distributed around. And uh, the deepest reservoir target for CO2 rich brine or in situ ex situ you know, method uh, below the lower mainland BC, of course, is upper Cretaceous, particularly areas that possess favorable reservoir characteristics. And they are uh, where they are deeper than uh, 1,000 meter, and at least five um, kilometer away from map faults. As you see, you know the polygon. Uh, the red polygon shows you know five uh, kilometer offset from uh, faults. Uh, upper Cretaceous strata in western and central LMBC uh, occurs at the depths. 3,070 meter to 1,735 meters. In eastern lower mainland BC, upper Cretaceous strata are found uh, at shallower depths, which are not recommended for uh, CC uh, US or the CO2 storage. Uh, the density of falls in upper Cretaceous strata appears to be lower in western LMBC compared to central and eastern lower mainland BC. So there might be a chance to consider some areas, uh, maybe western LMBC for. Uh, CO2 storage, uh, all the further studies uh, required. In uh, For upper Cretaceous in Western and Central LMBC, uh, some tertiary strata exhibit uh, suitable characteristics for CO2 storage, including good reservoir qualities, uh, size, and uh, suitable depth. 
file density in tertiary strata uh, through central and western LMBC is low, and uh, the reduced number of faults for sure minimizes uh, risk of long term CO2 leakage. Uh, where tertiary strata exhibit below 1000 meter and five kilometer from known fault, they're considered prospective for CO2 storage, especially using in situ and uh, ex situ storage. And for the summary, so deep saline aquifers are key target for CO2 storage, particularly in the areas uh, where oil and gas uh, production is limited, such as uh, lower mainland BC. Tertiary strata in Western and Central, LMBC exhibit a good reservoir, good reservoir characteristics, and they can be considered for uh, CO2 storage, with mainly areas uh, where are five kilometers at least away from faults. Uh, upper Cretaceous, of course, we have we see numerous faults, so we have less chance, but still further studies required to find out. And um, in eastern lower mainland BC, upper Cretaceous strata occur at shallower depth and could be potentially act as a reservoir for CO2 storage, uh, mainly where uh, strata are uh, deeper than 1,000 meter and again. Uh, five kilometers away from uh, mapped faults. And eventually this uh, regional scale synthesis of subsurface data in the lower MLMC provides a broad overview of CO2 storage and prospectivity in the region. And of course, more studies uh, are in the way to find out the particular reservoir characterization. And in the end, I acknowledge, you know, this study is funded through grant to Dr. Shaheen Dashgard from BC Ministry of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovation and the National Sciences and Energy Research Council of Canada. Geoscience BC has thanked uh, because of the scholarship that I'm awarded, both in 2022 and 2023. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mazier. Uh, three great presentations. Uh, thank you very much for uh, those presentation speakers.